Hello everyone, welcome back to Thinkology. My name is Robin, and on today's episode of Past Pass, we're going to talk about Disney. Not Disney as a whole, there's way too much to unpack there for one video, but Disney's Discovery Island. Yes, Disney owns an island. I'm sure none of you are surprised by that considering how massive and powerful they are, but still, I was curious what this island used to be, why Disney bought it, and how it's used today. So, without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Discovery Island sits within Bay Lake, Florida, close by the Walt Disney World Resort. The earliest paper trail about this island that I could find is when Henry B. Plant from the Plant Investment Company purchased this area of land and the island with it as he was expanding his railway network. Obviously, this island didn't really have much use for him as a railroad operator. So, a few years after receiving the land from Florida's Internal Improvement Fund, Plant sold the land to Charles Lackey in 1887. Information here is, again, pretty sparse, but we know that Lackey owned the property for 16 years before he sold it to Peter Keen on March 6th in 1903. Keen only owned it for three years before selling it to Joel Riles in April of 1906. Few sources about the island seem to go this far back in time, but one author that did wrote, I believe this is the same Riles for whom the island was named for for a long time. Even many modern maps still refer to it as Riles Island. Wikipedia refers to the island as Raz Island during this time, which is also referred in an Orlando Sentinel article which in turn cites the book Since the World Began by Jeff Curdy. It's possible Raz Island was simply a misunderstanding of Riles Island, or it could be that a Raz family lived there without regard for ownership of the island. I couldn't find any evidence of a Raz family ever having a claim on the property, and all the existing references I could find referring to them are all still unsourced. All of my sources that state it was called Riles after the man that lived there don't actually have any sort of documentation linked to this family. One source says the island was known as both Raz Island as well as Idol Bay Isle, only to later be called Riles Island for a second time. With so many owners, it's no wonder things got confusing so easily. It seems this island was destined to trade hands again, though, as Riles fell behind on his taxes and, after eight years of ownership, the state of Florida reclaimed the property in 1915. The state then sold it to a man named W.H. Reams. It took three long years, but in 1918, Reams finally received a proper deed to the property. Reams was apparently a pretty unusual guy. He later went on to become the mayor of Winter Garden, a city in Florida he had served in in the Spanish-American War, and he was even wrapped up in his uncle's strange disappearance at one point. However, despite the state selling the island to this Reams character, Riles wasn't completely out of the picture. In fact, in 1917, before Reams received his first official deed, Riles had tried to sell the property to a man named Jim Gear. Jim likely didn't know about Riles' tax repossession, so when he found out, Reams figured he could make a few dollars. After all, he purchased the island at a tax sale, and here was a buyer that truly wanted it. Jim and Susan Gear finally took possession of the island in 1919 and, about a year later, transferred it to F.R. Gear, likely a family member, maybe even a gift from parents to son. Now, my sources state that F.R. Gear owned the island for a few years himself before then selling it to an F.A. Rollins in 1924. This likely upset his parents, who clearly worked quite hard to get that island, having purchased it twice only to have their son sell it off again so quickly. Rollins added insult to injury by failing to pay his taxes on the property in 1926, resulting in another tax sale on the island in 1927. By this time, Jim Gear had passed away, and his widow Susan makes the bold move of buying the property back from the state of Florida. In doing so, I believe she finally rectifies the mistake of leaving the island to her son in the first place. Susan owns the property for eight more years, before deciding to sell it to a local man named Delmar Nicholson. But she's smart. 
just to be sure there were no complications with the sale after the incident with unpaid taxes, she also secures a quitclaim deed from the Rollins family, officially revoking any claims they might have had on the property. And with that, the gear portion of the saga is over, and we have a clear ownership of the land by Nicholson, beginning in 1937. After that very messy history of transfers, purchases, and possessions, the property was in Nicholson's hands. This is where the more known history of the island begins, and where we can begin to find more information about the place's pre-Disney days. Delmar Radio Nick Nicholson got his name from his work in the early days of radio. The Orlando Sentinel refers to him as Florida's first radio disc jockey. Nicholson apparently lived on the island for 20 years with his wife and his pet crane. I mean, how much cooler can you get? A pet crane? That's pretty baller. Not only that, but a radio jockey with a pet crane? Come on. Nicholson was also an avid herpetologist and naturalist who was apparently Orange County's earliest successful growers of orchids. In addition, he was instrumental in establishing the first city zoo in downtown Orlando in the 30s. He has followed each development and advancement in the science and has adapted himself to all of these changes, which are bringing broadcasting and radio reception to a higher peak of perfection. A 1937 Sunday Sentinel Star story said, There are stories that Nicholson was a recluse, a Satanist or a Wiccan, and seemed to have a dark cloud floating over him at all times. The post I found states that Radio Nick also created a dark presence on the island. This is only a creepy pasta, though. I wasn't able to actually find any evidence of this whatsoever. I just find it interesting that he's become this strange villain in these stories told about this place. Back to the island. One old photo shows that, in 1946, the island had clear signs of an organized fruit-growing operation as well. Nicholson had truly made this place his home up until the Idle Bay Isle was dissolved in 1952 and when Flora Thomason bought the property. The Thomasons decided to sell the property in 1955. They sold it to a large group of locals with three trustees listed as Arnold, Beery, and Root. The Thomasons still owed their own mortgage though, so there's a stipulation in the new mortgage that the group pay the Thomasons for their remaining responsibilities to Nicholson. Yeah, it only gets slightly complicated for some reason. A little more digging reveals this new group to be called the Bay Isle Club, which planned to manage campsites on the property, but would keep the island itself private for their own use. At this point, we also get an indication that Nicholson's home on the island itself was the only developed piece of the entire property around the lake at the time. That said, they still opened the island for occasional social gatherings when it suited them, including the annual trip of the Orlando Optimists. The Thomasons complete their obligations to Nicholson in 1959, and the Bay Isle Club completes its six-year mortgage to the Thomasons in 1962. Finally, Disney entered the picture just a few years later when they bought the island in 1965. Now, Walt himself died in 1966, and the focus of Disney really became building Walt Disney World, resorts, and theme parks. Disney originally planned to add a pirate theme to the island and call it Blackbeard's Island, but the name was discarded and changed to Treasure Island. It was meant to be a retreat for exploration and relaxation with wrecks of pirate ships. However, in 1974, plans to add a wide variety of tropical birds to the island emerged and it opened to the public in April of 1974 as a relaxing bird sanctuary, with a few remnants of the pirate theme still present. More than 600 birds were planned for, new man-made bodies of water were present on the island, and it was turned into a tropical paradise. At first, the island wasn't all that popular. But then, in 1977, to coincide with the theatrical release of The Rescuers, Disney, in conjunction with General Electric, ran the Rescuers Diamond Sweepstakes. It offered the opportunity for one lucky family to win a trip to Walt Disney World and search and dig for a diamond on Treasure Island worth $25,000. Now, just four years after its opening, the natural inhabitants of the island grew faster than its popularity with guests. The island abandoned any references to the pirate theme in 1978 and was renamed Discovery Island, which focused on the island's rich botanical settings and wildlife such as 
flamingos, pelicans, eagles, alligators, peacocks, swans, rabbits, and deer. The island featured a 40-foot tall, 320 by 102-foot walk-through aviary, bird shows, a flamingo pool, and turtle beach. The Thirsty Perch snack bar was constructed, and it even had the Jose Carioca Flyers Bird Show, which was performed in the Cuckoo Cabana. There were also bird demonstrations as well as scavenger hunts, which was available to the guests as they arrived on the island. The 20 question hunt had clues with answers that could be found on signs throughout the island. Successfully answering all of the questions entitled a guest to a Jiminy Cricket environmentality Earth Day button. I mean, come on, you know Disney at this point. You pay hundreds if not thousands of dollars for a trip and you can win buttons that cost them four cents to make. It's said that even 1,000 tons of boulders and trees were exported from other countries, such as China, South Africa, and the Himalayas, to create an entirely new landscape. Disney seemingly gained a fantastic reputation. In 1981, they were made an accredited zoological park by the American Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums. Postcards around the time from Discovery Island featured their incredibly gorgeous birds, and their 1977 brochure referenced the blue peafowl, vulturine guinea fowl, Caribbean flamingo, Chilean flamingo, southern bald eagle, macaw, cockatoo, African crowned crane, demoiselle crane, and sandhill crane. Many of these were housed in one of the largest walk-through aviaries in the world. Plant life was imported from around the world as well, like banana, palm, and bamboo from East India, gardenias from China, orchid trees from India, and passion flowers from South America. They truly began to focus on conservation and became renowned for their bird, plant, and tortoise populations. Brochures from the 80s and even into the 90s showed their increasing focus on environmental responsibility as well, with fun facts about their plants and animals like the muntjac deer, native to Southeast Asia, and bamboo. One description of the island reads, As you left the Discovery Island dock, you encountered the Thirsty Perch snack bar and the restrooms on your left. The map directed you to the right toward the Discovery Island bird show near the North Inlet. In some areas, the walkway was elevated, crossing ponds, wetlands, and marshy areas where birds and animals roamed freely. There were plenty of animal encounters as you passed Trumpeter Springs, North Falls, Swan's Neck, and Bamboo Hollow. Next in the journey was Monkey Point, home of the colony of lemurs from Madagascar and their distant relatives, the Marmoset. Crane's Roost and Toucan Corner were the final viewing opportunities before you entered the enormous walk-through aviary, home of the striking Scarlet Ibis and so many other exotic birds which were visible over, under, and beside the elevated boardwalks of Avian Way. Soon after exiting the aviary, you arrive at Pelican Bay, populated by injured pelicans which had been treated in the animal hospital housed on the island. These injured birds spent their remaining years living in the lap of luxury as Disney guests. Doesn't sound too bad, honestly. I wonder how much they charge those birds. This sounds amazing, right? If they were accredited, then they must have been a legitimate conservation. Well, things get a bit messy here. Now, one source claims that it was Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park that ended things for Disney's Discovery Island. As true as that may be, there was a lot more happening behind the scenes that wasn't exactly in line with the conservation efforts Disney promoted. The first time that Discovery Island made headlines for a negative reason was when the Dusky Sparrow went extinct there. From 1975 to 1980, the population had been decreasing at a rate of 50% every year, in part because of road construction, pesticide spraying, and a massive wildfire. Scientists had hoped to save the species from extinction by crossbreeding it with other sparrows. But there were no pure duskies in 1987, when the final dusky sparrow named Orange Band passed away in captivity. On June 18, 1987, the Washington Post read, As far as we know, there are not any more said U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service spokeswoman Megan Durham. This marks the extinction of the species. No females or evidence of reproduction in the wild has been seen since 1975, and this bird was more than 12 years old. 
The death of Orange Band ends a last-ditch effort to save the Dusky through crossbreeding. The male Duskies that had been mated to Scott's seaside sparrows. Scientists hoped the resultant offspring could be mated again with Duskies to produce birds with ever-purer Dusky bloodlines. The experiment produced five part Duskies, one male and four females. One of the females is seven-eighths Dusky, but the loss of the last pure Dusky means that no offspring will ever be purer than that. Scientists still hope to repopulate the wild with the hybrid birds, which are fertile and look purebred. Disney World curator Charles Cook said the last bird's heart and liver will be frozen in hopes that technology will someday make it possible to recreate the species through cloning. Now that is one of the most insane things I have heard recently. It makes me wonder if Walt's frozen head isn't such a conspiracy. Now I don't blame Disney for the death of the Dusky Sparrows, as they were trying to save them. It's tragic that they weren't able to do more, but I don't think it would be right to blame Disney for the population declining. However, what upset some people is how they handled these part Duskies within just a couple years. In June of 1989, almost exactly two years after Orange Band passed away, four of these crossbred sparrows died or disappeared when strong winds ripped a hole in their cage. The Orlando Sentinel stated that, Now, the only vestige of Florida's unique brown and white sparrow lies in freezers awaiting museum display or cloning research. By the time a pickled specimen of the Dusky ends up at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will probably have abandoned any hope for its species' comeback. One bird did remain in its cage, but escaped when keepers tried to move it to a more secure location, which may be the most upsetting aspect of this whole thing. Even after the storm, even after one bird was found dead, Disney couldn't save this last remaining sparrow, and it escaped their grasp. How? I'll never know. Worse yet, Disney tried to keep the death and disappearances low-key, despite its breeding program being pretty well known. The Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission didn't learn about the Duskies' demise until two months after it happened, though the Fish and Wildlife Service had heard about it the same day. Some would argue that we lost a scientific opportunity to learn something. Although we've had those birds in captivity a fairly long time and learned about everything we could, said Don Wood, Endangered Species Coordinator for the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. In an ecological sense, it's an absolutely, totally insignificant loss. In the philosophical sense, it would depend on whoever's talking to you. Yeah, that's how a lot of things work there, my friend. To Charlie Cook, Discovery Island's curator and a man who has dedicated six years to salvaging what was left of a doomed species, the loss was a devastating event. It felt like Mother Nature was kind of upset at everybody. A whole lot of philosophical things go through your mind. Is the extinction of the Dusky Sparrow entirely Disney's burden to bear? Not really. But it was around this time that people began to notice the care that really happened on Discovery Island, and questions started to rise about the treatment of the animals. After all, even if they may not have been to blame for the Dusky Sparrow species going extinct, they were responsible for the treatment of their animals. Okay, now I'm gonna put a trigger warning right here and say that this portion of the video is going to mention animal abuse. If you aren't in a place to hear that, I more than understand, and please skip ahead. We'll put a timestamp here for you for when this section ends. Around the time the Dusky Sparrow went extinct, in 1989, PETA began taking issue with their mistreatment of animals. Although PETA is a massive hypocrite for calling Disney out, when they are a massive kill shelter themselves, by the way, PETA brought up an incident when Disney mistreated several vultures that landed at Discovery Zoo. And by mistreatment, well, workers beat the vultures to death with sticks, destroyed the nests and eggs of ibises and egrets, and routinely fired a rifle at hawks. That's a bit more than just an occasional mistreatment! A two-month investigation resulted in 16 state and federal charges filed against Disney and five of its employees in September of 1989, most dealing with the death of vultures. They had been killed by being crammed into a tiny, overheated shed for days with limited food and water. The Orlando Sentinel wrote on September 24th of that year, 
Disney has refused to comment on the charges. <laughs> What an absolutely incredibly large surprise there. Look at my surprised face. A state report concluded that many of the employees at Discovery Island carried out illegal activities at the direction of curator Charlie Cook, and that the workers were acting with the understanding that those activities were legal and authorized under Walt Disney World permits. The recriminations go beyond the legal problems that Disney faces. The documentation of the killing and inhumane treatment of protected wild birds has led other zookeeping professionals to question Discovery Island's management. It looks very, very bad, said Robert Wagner, executive director of the Wheeling, West Virginia-based Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums. When Disney did finally address the scathing report, they claimed to have misunderstood the conditions of a federal permit that allowed them to trap and relocate the vultures that were pecking at park animals, bothering visitors, and destroying park property. I'm not even saying that Disney needed to welcome these vultures with open arms and let them harass park visitors, but maybe treat them in a humane way? I mean, are you absolutely freaking kidding me? These are animals. They genuinely don't know any better. If Disney wanted to relocate them, yes, they had permission to do so. Instead, they kept 72 vultures in windowless, airless sheds that were legally big enough to only have three. Workers would even break the legs and smash the bodies of trapped vultures. How in the hell can Disney justify that? Spokesman John Dreyer even had the nerve to say that they were still proud of what Discovery Island is and will work closely with wildlife officials to make any corrections that need to be made. Sure, Disney cares about wildlife, but only the wildlife that was making them money. The Orlando Sentinel read, In federal court, Disney is charged with three counts of unlawfully trapping or trying to trap vultures, ibises, and egrets all protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Act. Disney could be fined as much as $30,000 and has been ordered to appear before U.S. Magistrate Donald Dietrich on October 5th to answer the charges. In state court, Disney and its 40-year-old Discovery Island curator, Cook, are each charged with illegally capturing or trying to capture vultures, ibises, hawks, falcons, and owls, improperly holding vultures while in captivity and improperly caring for them. Howard Rajanis, 22, lead keeper at Discovery Island, and Jeff Goodman, 21, another keeper, both of Orlando, are charged with animal cruelty in the beating of trapped vultures to death with a stick. Donald Brumfield, 38, of Sorrento, and Michael Cockrell, workers at Pigeon Loft, are charged with illegally trying to capture owls, hawks, and falcons. All of the state charges are misdemeanors, with a maximum penalty of six months in jail and a $500 fine upon conviction. The five employees, plus a Disney representative, must appear in court on October 30th to enter, please. Really? 500 bucks or six months in jail? It's only a misdemeanor to beat the shit out of endangered species? It's only a misdemeanor to beat certain animals to death? What the hell is going on here in Florida? Discovery Island paid $95,000 in fines to make this go away, which for Disney, even back in 1990 when this was settled, was a drop in the bucket. You can't be an advocate for wildlife, then treat animals this way. What Disney did is truly despicable and disgusting, yet it seemed like it was simply swept under the rug. Not really a big surprise with Florida. Company officials never actually admitted any wrongdoing. They made the necessary improvements to the attraction, and Discovery Island closed about a decade later in 1999 anyway, just after Animal Kingdom officially opened in 1998. A few years before the park closed in 1993, footage of the park depicts it as this beautiful place for nature to thrive, and animals look like they have far more space and natural resources than they would in a zoo. You'd think, just by looking at this place on the surface, that it was a haven for these creatures. It may have been, I don't see any evidence of Disney abusing the exotic birds that were a part of their exhibit in any of my sources. But the way that dozens of other birds were abused and even killed, here, that's pretty stomach-churning. Whether it was the abuse, Animal Kingdom opening up, or a combination of the two, Discovery Island has remained closed to the public since 1999. Disney has banned all outings to the island. You're not allowed to get within 50 feet of its shoreline, and legal action can be taken against you if you do. 
One photographer, Steph Lawless, has actually been banned from visiting Disney World parks for life after he published drone and zoom photos of the abandoned island as it's seen as trespassing. A few conspiracies surround the park. Some believe that it was closed due to the presence of Negleria fowlery bacteria in the water across the lake. This bacteria did kill an 11-year-old boy in 1980, but as this happened 20 years before the park was closed, it seems unlikely to be the main cause. It does seem as if Animal Kingdom opening up was the most likely reason, especially when you factor in that many of the animals from the island were actually transferred to Animal Kingdom itself, leaving the island virtually abandoned. Despite the consequences, trespassers do still make their way onto the island in the name of urban exploration. If a place is banned or off-limits, it's probably for a good reason, so I can't really condone their actions, no matter how interesting the footage is. The aviary pathway is still intact, built so that guests could see birds eye-to-eye -eye elevated off the ground. Huge piles of signs and garbage and structures have been left behind, though, and as of 2017, there's no work happening on the island. Some sources claim that they almost turned Discovery Island into a sort of mist island, taken from the popular video game series Mist Creators, Robin and Rand Miller have confirmed this, according to my source. Mist Island would have attempted to duplicate the look and feel of the award-winning computer games. Only a limited number of guests would have been allowed onto the fog-shrouded island each day. They'd have been dropped off by a boat in the early morning and then picked up in the late afternoon. Their mission was to explore the ruins scattered around the 11-acre island to try and figure out what happened to the island's previous occupants. This day-long adventure would have been unlike anything that Disney theme park guests had ever experienced before. Just like the CD-ROM games that inspired it, Mist Island would have no linear storyline. Guests could only discover the various puzzles scattered around Mist Island by exploring all of its weird little nooks and crannies. Depending on which path they took, which artifacts they uncovered, as well as the order in which the guests discovered them, different secrets of the island would have been revealed. Theoretically, no two guests could ever have the exact same adventure as they wandered the terrain. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I had no idea about that. That sounds freaking cool, and I'm incredibly disappointed that it did not turn out. What gives, Disney? Come on, I'd still go! I mean, for real, I think that would have been a fantastic idea, but as it stands, this doesn't seem meant to be. If Disney doesn't use Discovery Island, well, I hope they at least clean up after themselves and get rid of all the trash they've left behind eventually. As it stands, Discovery Island is abandoned and it looks like it's going to stay that way for a very long time. Hey, at least creepypasta writers are gonna have something fun to use though. It's always good to have something grounded in the real world. Phew, with all of that said though, that's where we're going to end today's Past Pass. Thank you so much for watching, thank you so much for listening, be sure to like and subscribe if you like this video, and if you want to see more content from me, Robin, you know the big, tall, good-looking drink of water, you can check out my links in the description down below. I'd love to have you around. And until next time, I'll catch you later, folks.